Radiant Acoustics Clarity 6.2. I was loaned these speakers from the manufacturer. They retail for about 4,000 euro for a pair or $4,500, you know, just depending on the conversion rate. They're very well engineered and there is a really good engineering type, marketing type video on their website. So I will drop a link to their website in the below description section. And I do encourage you to go and check that out. I'm not gonna cover all the marketing lingo or the engineering lingo in this video because I just don't have time to do that. But I do appreciate that video that they put out because it helps me better understand their product and what their goal is. I'm gonna be focusing more on what I heard and how what I heard relates to objective measurements. Because if I just talk about what I heard, and don't back it up with anything. Uh, personally speaking, that doesn't mean much. So I don't watch reviews like that. Hopefully you'll appreciate the effort that goes into explaining the data and the measurements. And there's some pretty neat things about the speaker that I really wanna dive into as well. So first up, let's talk about the sound. When I get speakers in, most of the time what I do is I will set them up about three feet out from the wall. I'll point them directly at me because most speakers are designed to be aimed on axis. And if you don't know what I mean by on axis, here is a graphic. In black is the speaker aimed directly at the listener, which would be on axis or zero degrees. If you tow the speaker out or in, you know, to aim it away from you, that would be off axis. And in this particular example, I'm showing you off axis in red, and it's about 30 degrees off axis. And I would also consider this toe out. Toe in would be more if you cross the speakers in front of you, okay? When the speakers are aimed on axis, what I tended to find was that the treble was a little bit elevated. Now, I was coming from a pair of speakers that measured very linearly, at least until about 8 to 10K. And when I played these, what I noticed was that the top end was, maybe there was more detail. And if you've watched my video, I do have a video talking about fake detail. Some of these speakers will add a whole lot of treble lift to make it sound detailed but sometimes that detail can be aggravating after a while. And I want to make the delineation here in saying that these speakers don't have that same sound where it becomes maybe just annoying or aggravating after a while. And there is a specific reason for that. And we're going to talk more about it when I get to the data. Okay, so hold on to that. I reached out to the manufacturer to ask them, hey, is this is this what you're expecting? I sent them my measurements and they said, well, here's the deal. These speakers were designed to be listened to at about 20 degrees off axis. And I said, okay, cool. I went back to the speakers. I turned them off axis a little bit. And what I noticed was that the treble was shelved down a little bit, not a whole lot, but it was much more to my liking. And personally, I found that about 15 degrees off axis, according to my ears and the data seemed to kind of be the best balance in overall soundstage width versus response, linearity, and or accuracy. So that's where I recommend you try to aim these speakers at. It's somewhere in that 15 to 20 degree window. Now, as far as putting the speakers near a wall or away from a wall, they actually do seem to benefit from being closed, closed, placed a little bit closer to the wall. Now, most manufacturers will tell you to bring the speaker out from the far or from the rear wall as far as you can. And that's supposed to help with soundstage depth and opening up the soundstage and giving you more spaciousness. In my subjective opinion, that is often true. Bringing the speakers out from the wall makes it sound more spacious in terms of depth, not necessarily side wall width or anything like that, but just the depth of the soundstage. But in doing so, if the speaker doesn't have a lot of bass, then you do feel like you're losing punch or you know, just some nice bottom end out of the speakers. I also know that some speakers are designed to be placed close to a wall. Now these particular speakers, I found that they benefited from being placed about two feet off the back wall. And I'm giving you an example here, two feet, roughly 0.6 meters or so from the back of the speaker to the wall behind the speaker is where I found that these speakers sounded best, at least in my living room. When these speakers were positioned this way, the bottom end reached down to about 40 Hertz in room with good authority. Now I'm not talking about 30 Hertz rumble bass, but nice punch and kick from the kick drum with the fundamental around 50 to 60 hertz typically is where you find that fundamental at. So the fact that these can get down to 40 hertz gives you a lot of headroom, if you will, for that particular frequency area, that, that nice kick drum punch that I like. For most music, you'll find that 40 hertz response is, is good enough. 
Now, if you listen to rap music or you're using these for home theater and you want rumble bass, use a subwoofer. I feel like that should go without saying. In terms of soundstage, imaging and focusing, these image very well in terms of preciseness. Little imaging, little dots in the soundstage. Hey, here's the drummer over here. Here's a singer over here. Here's a pianist, a violinist, whatever. You know, it's, it, they're mixed throughout the soundstage based on the recording, of course. Now, you can't make these things appear in certain places if the recording doesn't have that. With these speakers, when they're aimed directly on axis or if they're towed out a little bit, it didn't seem to matter in how it affected the imaging. So the imaging was nice and tight, and I really appreciate that. The other thing is that the soundstage is pretty darn wide. I was actually a little bit surprised at that, and I don't know why, because there's nothing in the design that makes me think that it shouldn't be wide. And in fact, knowing how AMT tweeters typically behave, I would have expected them to sound wide, and they did, but they don't sound wide above about five kilohertz or so. And again, I'm gonna show you why that is in the data. Now that's not necessarily a drawback. Most of the stereo width will come from the mid range. Of course, pair matching is another thing that gives you imaging and focus. For example, if you set up a pair of stereo speakers in your living room and you're listening and it sounds like images aren't where they're supposed to be in the sound stage, that could be because maybe there's a crossover flaw in one of the speakers. So maybe two to three kilohertz is completely different in response from one speaker to the other speaker. So it's gonna smear, it's gonna pull a little bit to that dominant speaker. When I measured both of these speakers, they were within about a decibel or so of each other, which is what helps to give further improved imaging accuracy. If you watched my Kef Blade 2 meta video, you know that I really harped on Michael Jackson's wannabe starting something. There is a click kind of sound at the beginning of that track. Well, roughly about 30 to 40 seconds in, I can't remember exactly where, and if you want, go back and watch that video because I kind of deep dive into it a little bit more. But with most speakers, you don't hear the resolution and that click sound. It doesn't really sound distinct. Now, listen, now that I've talked about it, you're going to go back and listen to it in your speakers and you're going to say, well, I hear it. I hear it just fine. But before, I promise you didn't notice it. I promise you. With a good pair of speakers, it stands out. With a, an average pair of speakers, it just kind of blends into the mix and you don't really notice it as a separate instrument. So with these speakers, that's one thing I was listening for. And when I fired the speakers up and I listened to that track, clearly you could hear the, like the, the clicking, scratching sound that I don't know what instrument it is. I don't remember, but I covered it in that Kepley 2 meta video. But with these speakers, it was very distinct. And to me, that's a telltale sign of not just imaging, but overall tonality and the frequency response balance of a speaker. Now, before I talk about the objective, I'm gonna jump into some of the specifications and show you a quick little video from my living room of these speakers, just so you can get an idea of what they look like. The tweeter is a custom AMT air motion transformer. The mid-range is a six and a half Purify Yushindi model. Two passive radiators from Purify as well. This is a passive radiator enclosure, crossover frequency at 2400 Hertz. Some really high-end components in the crossover. Cabinet is 21 millimeters MDF with a 15 millimeter aluminum front baffle, which is really nice. There's a lot of internal bracing and damping going on. And the weight is roughly 24 pounds or 10.8 kilograms. What I've tended to find in my reviews of just purified drive units alone and speakers that use purified drive units, especially through the mid range, is more, I don't want to say detail because I'm really using that word a lot, but it feels like you can hear a more resolving characteristic. And I attribute that because I'm biased by the testing that I've done to lower distortion parameters. So even at higher volume, you're not running into graininess like you will with speakers that have higher distortion, especially through the mid range. Now we're gonna switch over and we're gonna talk about the data. But before I dive into that, just a quick reminder that I listen to these at about 15 to 20 degrees off axis per the manufacturer's recommendation. And the data that I'm gonna be providing you is gonna be a mix of standard on axis response as well as 15 degrees off axis response, which I found to be more linear overall. All the data that you're about to see is captured using my state of the art near field scanner from Clipple. It provides you anechoic data in a non anechoic environment and it doesn't cost you a million dollars or more like an anechoic chamber does. Starting off with the impedance, we can see that the minimum EPDR, it dips down to one ohm. 
and the minimum impedance is about 2.1 ohm. So you're gonna want an amplifier that's capable of driving at least a four ohm load for these. This is the response on axis. And then if I switch to 15 degrees off axis, this is what we get. And you can see the difference mainly in the top end. So if I go back to on axis, see the top end is a bit more elevated through here. And if I go to slightly off axis, we wind up with this, but we're not done yet. Before I go there though, F3 at 55 Hertz, F10 at 32 Hertz when aimed off axis, because the F3 and the F10 are relative to the average SPL and the average SPL is about 84 decibels at 2.83 volts, one meter. This is the CEA 2034 data set, which is the spin -orama. Now I don't typically harp too much on this because I talk about other things, but this data looks nice and good. Now notice what I'm calling out here, rising on axis response counters narrowing directivity, yielding a more linear in room response. Okay, the high frequency starting at about 2K, it starts to increase. Same thing you just saw a minute ago, but the directivity is narrowing. The increasing SPL on axis or even off axis combined with the narrowing high frequency yields a more linear in room response. That may sound confusing, I'm not done yet. Earlier I talked about what I heard in the room. I said it sounds pretty much neutral when it's aimed slightly off axis. I talked about how the mid range had nice detail and how that's a good sign of low distortion, but also, and maybe more importantly, the linearity, okay? So now I'm gonna show you the estimated interim response. The estimated interim response is provided via a whole bunch of anechoic measurements. And it basically says in a standard room, you're gonna have reflection points at these certain angles versus the direct sound that hits you. And if you take all that and combine it together, you wind up with a generalized tonality curve for a particular speaker. And in my experience now at like 200 something speakers, what I can tell you is that what I hear and what I write down in my listening notes, which are done before I see the measurements, always lines up with the estimated in response. And in fact, I've gotten to the point where I personally put more weight on the estimated interim response. Now there are other caveats you have to consider, but in terms of tonality, I personally, personally put more weight on what the estimated interim response shows because that lines up with what I've heard in the past. So with that said, what I'm providing in the estimated interim response is three different angles. Black is zero degrees, blue is 15 degrees, and then red is my standard 30 degrees because some speakers are designed to be placed pointing directly out into the room. This is the curve for how I heard the speaker. One thing that stands out to me is this bump up right around 500 Hertz. Gotta be honest, I didn't hear that. So I don't really have a highlight noting that, but it might sound a little bit more, what's the word I'm looking for here? Boxy, if you notice it, but again, I didn't notice it. Interim extension into about the 40 Hertz region. So before it really starts to roll off, that's around 40 Hertz right here. So I'd say good interim response down to 40 Hertz is plenty reasonable. You may be wondering, if you've been paying attention to my other videos, you may be wondering why is it that the on axis frequency response is increasing by as much as maybe two to three decibels from 2K to 20K, but the estimated interim response is falling pretty linearly. You may be wondering that. Well, let me show you why. That is because the radiation pattern of the speaker is narrowing. So what I'm showing you here is the direct sound at zero degrees right here. And then as you go to 180 degrees, you're going behind the speaker. The colors on this indicate the SPL fall off rate. So in this darker red right here, that's the highest SPL. And as you go down to the lighter red, the orange, yellow, and then the blue, that's lower SPL. You can read that here. Typically what I like to do is look at the negative six decibel marking and that's gonna be right where I've drawn this line. So what we're seeing here is a narrowing directivity. Most of the other speakers that I've reviewed will have a directivity that might be flatlined through here. And it might be a constant 50 or 60 degrees or something like that. And with a dome tweeter, what happens is by the time you get to eight kilohertz, it just goes more narrow. This speaker is consistently narrowing above about 5K, but even below that as well. So, that narrowing combined with the increasing on axis response results in a nice tapered in room response. That's the trick to designing a proper speaker. And I can give you another example where if you take a constant directivity design, maybe a horn that has 
pretty much the same on axis versus off axis trend in the high frequency. And it's flat on axis. Most people would see that data and think, oh, this is going to be a great sounding speaker. But I know because I've been doing this long enough that it's going to sound probably a bit bright in room, maybe a bit treble heavy in the room. That's because that flat on axis combined with the flat directivity in that region means that when you get to the treble, it's going to be flat in room. You don't really want that. Now you can equalize that down because it has good directivity, but naturally on its own, it's going to sound like a bright speaker. That's why you'll see some designs such as Kef and, and there are others that I can't recall right now. They, instead of targeting a, maybe a flat on axis response, they might go a little bit more shallow. Maybe they might deviate that top end response and make it tilt down a little bit on the higher end. They do that because they also have pretty much a flat directivity. And so in order to not have a bright sounding speaker in the room, they're shaping that on axis frequency response to also go with that flat directivity. And for those of you who don't know what I mean, just to recap, directivity are these lines. So this is estimated in room, early reflections directivity, and this is total sound power all the way around the speaker. If this were flat right through here, that would be constant directivity. If it were linear in shape, that would be controlled directivity. Vertical response is within about plus or minus 15 degrees of the tweeter midline. Harmonic distortion at 86 decibels, this peaking right here, I gotta be honest, I'm not sure what's causing that. I tested both speakers, both speakers have it. And then I went back to my reference speaker and it looked fine. So this is actually the speaker. I'm not sure what's causing it. Maybe it's a basket resonance, but I didn't hear it. At 96 decibels, everything else is increased just a touch. You still got that peaking right there. And I'm not harping on it because I find it's offensive, but I just find it interesting that it is there. But again, the overall distortion is really quite low. Even at 96 decibels, your mid-range distortion is below 50 decibels. And this right here is around 1%. Multitone distortion testing is the thing that I find most correlatable to what I hear when I'm doing my subjective listening. And I draw this line at 3% distortion because that's kind of my general trend. I would normally say that if it's above 3%, then you might be more apt to hear that below 3%, you're probably not going to hear it or it's not gonna be enough of an issue to really notice it. So this testing is done at three, no, four different outputs, 70 decibels, which is four, four, nine volts, uh, then 78, 87, and then 96 in green. So it caps out at 96 decibels. This is taken at about one meter. So if you're further away from the speakers, but then you add another speaker, things change, but to keep things constant, I like using these numbers because they give me a good idea of the overall distortion performance of the speaker. And I would say that this is in line with what I would want it to be. What about dynamic range? This speaker is class leading. I went back and looked at some of my other reviews of other speakers that are maybe comparable to this in terms of price or overall performance. And at this price, I believe that this is one of, if not the best compression testing results that I've seen. So that means that at low volume versus high volume, you're gonna have a nice dynamic range. And that does it for my review. Overall, I really like this speaker. I do suggest towing it out slightly off axis by about 15 to 20 degrees to get the best overall sound. But if you tend to find that you like a speaker that is a little bit elevated in treble, just point them directly at you. As far as placement, about two feet off the back wall, as I said earlier, tended to work the best for me, but you can play around with that as much as you want to. You can move it closer to increase the bass a little bit, whatever you wanna do. Play around with it is what I suggest, but that's where I would put maybe my starting point. If you enjoy this review or you have any questions, leave me a comment or a like below, and I'll try to address those as best I can. If you'd like to help this channel, you can do so one of two ways. You can join me at patreon.com where you get some behind the scenes information, polls, input into maybe what I'm gonna review next, all those sort of things, and that really is appreciated. Another thing you can do is you can use any of my generic affiliate links so if you're gonna buy something from Amazon or you're gonna buy maybe a projector from Crutchfield or a speaker from Audio Advice or any mixture of any of those things, something from Target or Newegg, please click one of the affiliate links below. That will take you to their standard homepage. And then you can just search for whatever it is that you wanna buy, buy that. And that does help me earn a small commission off that purchase. And I really appreciate that. It's not a lot, but it does add up. And that allows me to maybe have Chick-fil-A for breakfast or buy myself a Snickers if I'm really hungry and starting to verge on the edge of hangry. Those kind of things help out a lot. Again, I do appreciate it. All right, 
I will talk to you all later. Take care. Peace.